I would like to regale you, if I may, I crave your indulgence, with a tale of possible warfare, of inferred mayhem, of tentatively interpreted battle, in this video which has been sponsored by Audible. More of that later. Now, in northeast Germany there is a valley called the Tollenser Valley, through which a river flows, and archaeologists in this paper, the name of which is appearing on your screens now, have kept their scientific minds working and have tentatively interpreted what they found as the remains of a Bronze Age battle in northeast Germany. And this was quite exciting for them because, well, battles are not things that naturally lend themselves to the archaeologists' trowel. Archaeologists spend almost all their time digging up graves and refuse pits and settlements and so forth. You know, things that stay still for a long time and accumulate, you know, stuff that tells us information about, you know, the past. Whereas a battle might last only a few hours, so how do you dig up a battle? Well, in the 1980s, uh, a lot of bronze finds were being dredged up from the river bottom, and that piqued the archaeologists' interest. They took a look at them and noticed that they were tend to be small, and there were an awful lot of weapons. Let's have a look at some of the things that came out. Spearheads, for instance. You can see an axe there. There's a sickle. That round thing is the lid of a box, various pins. And that line drawing at the bottom is a fibula. That's a, a fancy sort of brooch. So. Uh, could these have been evidence for a battle? Um, they decided to investigate further, and in 1996 opened this pit, and they, one of the things they found made them think, oh, maybe we have found some evidence of a battle here, because again they found no evidence for settlement. There were no loom weights, no uh, pots and pans, pottery, you know, the usual things that you find when you, you dig up a settlement. No one appeared to be living here, and yet they found a lot of human bones and one of them had an arrowhead embedded in it. It was embedded in metric, up, upwards, at that sort of angle in the back of the bone. Uh, I say in metric because, of course, this was Germany, so it was 22 millimetres deep. Uh, had the arrow been shot in Britain, it would have been seven-eighths of an inch deep. But there you go, uh, they embedded in metric over there. Um, now, that's an odd place for an arrow to be embedded. It's very difficult to, to shoot yourself accidentally in, just there. So. Fairly clearly, this man had been shot by someone else. So, was it in a battle? Had he put his arms up to defend himself and got shot that way? Or possibly he'd been shot by another arrow, gone down, and then been shot again whilst lying on the ground? That would explain the rather unusual uh, entry angle of this arrowhead. The arrowhead didn't show any signs of having ricocheted. It was a complete piece of flint. Bronze Age, fairly typical Bronze Age flint arrowhead. So, they thought, oh, we might be onto something here. So, they carried on digging. And uh, they found quite a lot of bones, almost all of them human, some animals mixed in there, almost all of them horses, and uh, the, the demography of the humans was quite significant. There were, yes, some children, some women, but almost all of them were of men between 20 and 40 years old, fighting age. So. That again backs up the idea that perhaps this is actually a battle they found. Now there were two star finds of the dig, uh, which were both probably weapons, and they are these two wooden clubs. Uh, now one of them uh, looks a bit like a, a modern rounder's bat. It's that's not a stick. That is that is worked wood that has been quite deliberately shaped, and the other one looks a bit like like a croquet mallet or something. It's got a quite definite hammer head on it, and. Uh, reading the text of the report, I got the impression that they thought that perhaps the the uh, the curve on the handle was deliberate. I I think they're wrong. I think that that was straight, and that uh, uh, the ravages of time have have bent it over the millennia. But anyway, so we have two um, clubs of some sort. One about twenty nine inches long. The other one about twenty five and a half inches long. Um, now. Uh, that's unusual. And why did the wood survive? Well, it survived because this was very marshy ground. It was waterlogged conditions, and wood can, uh, if it's uh, sealed underground in um, fairly airtight waterlogged conditions, it can survive a very long time. So that's unusual. Uh, bronze uh, does survive quite a long time, and that might explain why you find more bronze weapons. It could be that things weren't getting more warlike, it's just that we were finding more of their weapons. Now, in the Iron Age, um, they presumably also produced an awful lot of spears and so forth, but we don't find nearly so many Iron Age spearheads as we do Bronze Age spearheads. But that, I put to you, is because of the fancy word coming now, taphonomy. Uh, the, the science, if you like, the process of how something ended up being found by an archaeologist. Now, iron 
rusts. Stick it in the ground for a few millennia and it's gone. It crumbles to nothing, usually. Now you may say, well hang on, I, I've seen Iron Age spearheads and, and Dark Age spearheads in, in, in museums and, and they look like spearheads to me and they appear to be made out of iron. Um, it could be that the person conserving it had covered the surface in, a, in some sort of graphite-y, silvery uh, stuff which uh, keeps it stable and serves the dual purpose of making it look more like iron. But actually, if you put a magnet on an Iron Age spearhead that uh, you're trying to, I don't know, steal by some clever subterfuge uh, from a museum, you will be disappointed because the magnet won't pick it up. There's pretty much no iron left. It's just ferric oxide. It's just rust that's uh, survived in the shape of the spearhead that was once of iron and has now been conserved deftly to look like an iron spearhead in a museum. Uh, whereas Bronze survives really quite well. I, I've dug up a few uh, bronze objects on uh, archaeological digs that I did many years ago and some of them come out of the ground even looking a bit shiny and some of them can buff up and look as new. Most of the stuff that I uh, picked out of the ground looked at a dark green gungy uh, surface because that's uh, the, the, the green patina that, that forms on the surface. But that can be uh, buffed off and, and quite often you go, yeah, yeah, that's a, a bronzy looking thing. So bronze survives very well. So it could be that actually they weren't tremendously warlike in this time, it's just that we're finding more of what has survived. And so what did they find? Well, in a layer of uh, river silt about uh, three to six feet down, they found a lot of the bones, as I say, and on analysing the bones, they found a lot of wounds on the bones, which again definitely supports the battle idea. Now, uh, a lot of these bones weren't in situ. They had been washed downstream from wherever they had initially been deposited, but some of them, further upstream, uh, appeared to be in anatomical relation to each other, though they weren't finding complete skeletons even so. Um, so how many people did they find? Well, we don't know. They found 38 skulls, so unless some of these people had two heads, which would be very unusual, that's at least 38 people. Uh, but if you find, say, a rib there and a rib there and a rib there, um, have you found three ribs from the same person or one rib from three different people? You can't always tell. Um, but they have, looking at what they've got, uh, recognise that they've got at least a hundred different people. At least a hundred people died in close proximity, both in time and place. And why was that then? Well, six to nine percent of them, depending exactly on how you count them, six to nine percent had wounds. That's that's a lot, uh, particularly when you, you imagine that they're not finding complete skeletons. So you'd imagine that if you found more of these skeletons, they'd have more wounds on them on different bones elsewhere on their bodies. And of course, there are probably more people out there to be found because they didn't excavate the entire valley. They just put you know, dug a few sample trenches. So they've got at least, at the very least, a hundred different individuals and with a lot of wounds. Um, you've got some identifiable wounds, some uh, puncture marks from arrows and spearheads that are quite identifiably that, uh, and others less so. Now, there are four different categories of wound, and you could say that the cheeriest, the nicest of these wounds is the type that had healed. Well, that's great, isn't it? That's a cheery thought, the idea that even back then you could, you could suffer an injury that's so bad that it's, it, it shows on your skeleton. I mean, how many times have you in your life uh, suffered an injury which could be spotted by an archaeologist looking at your skeleton 4,000 years later? I imagine not very many. I don't think I've got a single mark on my skeleton that would give away what injuries I've suffered. Um, but there was one chap who had three of these on his head. Yeah, three massive craters in his head that had all healed. So what does that mean? You could say, uh, and this is probably the simplest and most straightforward explanation, that he lived in very violent times and he'd been involved in three fights that he had presumably lost, but uh, they didn't finish him off permanently, uh, and that uh, he then lived to fight one more day and then didn't get... that was it, that was the end for him. Uh, or you could say, well, maybe he was I don't know, a miner and a, a rockfall uh, crushed part of his skull, but he was dragged from the, uh, the rockfall and, and nursed back to health with some good sustaining soup, and uh, then he went back in the mine, and would you believe it happened again? And no, he didn't get into the habit of uh, wearing a helmet, and it happened a third time. That's another possibility. But I think it's more likely that the fact that this guy had three nasty head wounds that had all healed uh, shows that he lived in violent times. Now, um, that's the first category, which you might say is the cheeriest, because it's you know, a nice thought that you could, you could suffer and still uh, get back to perhaps full health. The opposite of that, of course, is the wound which hasn't healed at all. Uh, so, for instance, there's, there's this uh, nastily shattered hip bone, and 
these are these are sharp edged bones in, in the break there there is no sign at all of any healing having taken place and so that tells us that this guy didn't live very long at all he suffered that wound and then died pretty much immediately afterwards um, and I didn't need to read the next sentence in the report to know what it was going to say possibly from a fall from his horse it said yeah that's the standard archaeologist's uh, cliche of any wound like that oh, fall from the horse maybe we don't know that of course he could have got drunk and fallen off a roof he could have slipped on a riverbank and landed on a rock maybe he a bull kicked him several times maybe his horse fell on him we don't know but it's not unreasonable fall from the horse sort of injury and it's, you can imagine if in battle you suffered that sort of injury uh, you would be then lying on the ground in agony shouting something along the lines of arg only in bronze age german and then someone perhaps with a spear would come along and finish you off and that would be the end of that then there's another category which is perhaps nastier and that is the wounds that had healed slightly showing us that these people didn't die immediately but died a couple of days later some of them may be a couple of weeks later that's worse isn't it because how do we interpret that the most obvious interpretation is that some of the people after what might have been a battle were lying there for days even weeks slowly dying and then their bodies were swallowed up by the river I would say that's less cheery but there's yet a fourth category which is perhaps even more bleh, and that is wounds on a bone some of which have healed a bit and some of which haven't so what does that tell us well again there are a number of possibilities but the most likelihood the greatest likelihood i would suggest is that someone uh, suffered a significant wound that went right down to his bone cut into the bone so that we can see it today and then he survived that fight and was you know sustaining soup again and then a very short while later before he was really fully fit again someone said no i'm sorry we need everyone we can get i know desperate times get in line with the rest i don't care bandage up take the pain and so a guy started the fight already wounded from a previous fight which really speaks of desperation doesn't it so it seems that a lot of people had a, were carrying a lot of injuries and then died in this place so life was nasty brutish and short it seems for a lot of people back then and it's a shame isn't it really you would you would like to think that we could appeal to the uh, you know the, the better angels of our nature and and to do something to to put violence into decline and perhaps that in fact has happened there is a book called uh, the better angels of our nature why violence has declined uh, by stephen pinker and uh, it talks about this very thing about how actually in the past things were so much worse modern media outlets are constantly trying to persuade us that things are getting worse all the time that we're getting more and more violent in society but in fact murder rates violent crimes there they are in developed nations on the way down and globally the number of people dying in wars goes down and down and down and modern warfare despite advances in modern weaponry actually isn't as deadly as old-fashioned warfare um you might think that's rather strange because surely people in in the, the big wars of the 20th century died in very large numbers uh, yes they did but the proportion of people involved in those wars who died was not as great as the proportion who died in earlier wars that involved fewer people tribal warfare is really nasty if you get a load of guys running at each other with spears and clubs and they biff away until one side eventually wins the casualty rate can be horrendous tribal warfare is roughly nine times deadlier uh, than modern warfare which is not a very nice thought uh, and even when there isn't a war on the murder rate in the past has been horrendous the the murder rate in in uh, medieval europe was 30 times what it is today although i'd just like to say uh, uh, you know advocacy of the the english that the murder rate in medieval england was a small fraction of what it was on the continent although for fairness i should add that it was still by modern standards alarmingly high so things were more violent back then and things are getting less violent for all sorts of reasons that he outlines in his book which you might want to read um now i have met stephen pinker a number of times uh, at uh, evolution conferences uh, back in the days when i was a a, a, a research associate with newcastle university uh, looking into evolutionary psychology and i made a video called built for the stone age which you might like to watch there's a link to it appearing i don't know somewhere on the screen um and uh, the reason actually i have a youtube channel at all is largely because of that i made a pilot 
tried for years to get uh, commissioners in British television to watch it, but I wasn't famous so no one would watch it, so I couldn't persuade anyone that the idea I had was good. Uh, and then YouTube came along and I thought, well, all right, I'll just stick it on YouTube and, and see if anyone uh, sees it there and perhaps picks it up. Nobody did. Well, it's a shame. I think you should watch it. I think still it's actually possibly the best thing I've done on YouTube. Um, and, you know, you might want to watch it just to see what I, I used to look like, uh, you know, before the dark times, before the bald patch. Anyway, um, so that's Built for the Stone Age. Um, Stephen Pinker's books, though, do have a flaw. They are very well researched, they're very dense, they're full of interesting facts, and they're also very funny. Well, all that's good, but they are very long. I do remember picking off uh, the shelf once in a bookshop um, uh, how the mind works, and loads of people have told me it was a really good book, and so I had a look at it, and I, and I saw that the the writing was really small. They'd picked a very, very small typeface, and I'd never known a book printed on thinner paper. These these tiny, fine sheets of gossamer. Uh, I think the publishers had thought that the, the full length of the book might terrify the potential buyer, and so they did everything they could to disguise the fact that it's a very long book. Had it been printed on normal paper in normal typeface, I think it would have been about that thick. Um, so they are a bit long, but they are good. If only there was some way, if only there was some way of enjoying their contents without all the slog of having to... But there is! You could go to Audible. Yes, Audible is a massive website online which has something like, oh, oodles. I mean, I mean, literally oodles. I'm not a man, to use a word like oodles lightly, of uh, titles that you can pick from. So don't give me the excuse, oh, I went to the site and I couldn't find a single title that interested me. If you have any interest in pretty much anything, you will find some book that interests you. And you can get to read it or listen to someone else read it to you whilst you, I don't know, drive to work on that awful commute that you have to suffer for an hour every day or whilst you're, I don't know, minding the kids or looking after the cat or whatever it is you have to do you can listen to it read to you for free! Because if you go to www.audible.com stroke Lindy Beige, all lowercase, uh, then you will find an offer of a 30-day free trial on the Audible website and you can pick any title you like, get it for free, listen to it for a bit, and you know what? It's even risk-free which one you pick because you might decide you don't like it very much, doesn't matter, just swap it for another one, no charge. And even if you decide you're not going to uh, uh, sign on for the full service and at the end of the month's uh, free trial you decide, no, it's not for me, and you sign out, you still get to keep the book. It's yours forever. You could even share it with a friend. So it's a risk-free thing you could try. So why not uh, go to uh, Audible? And they've got uh, some others of uh, Steve Pinker's as well. And if you want, you know, um, bang for your buck, if you like, you could do a lot worse because um, uh, the book I've just described is 36 and three quarter hours long. Yes, it's a mammoth book, uh, but it's full of fascinating stuff. And you know, so if you want, you want to get the most you can for nothing, then I don't know, that's a pretty good choice. Now, back to archaeology. So. Um, the Baltic, the sea, uh, was a fair bit higher back in those days um, because not so much of the world's water was locked up in ice. And so these rivers in northern Germany were very marshy and the river was slow flowing and quite broad. Uh, part of the reason we know that uh, is that because of the plant remains that we find in the river sediments which uh, show all sorts of plants that grow in slow moving water like reeds and so forth. Um, and analysis of pollen and other biological remains tells us that there was quite a bit of forest around, but also some farmed land, and these poor swines were living on a millet-based diet. Could you believe it? Anyway, thank goodness I'm modern. Um, now, there's something called isotope analysis. You can look at the isotopes that have been deposited in people's bones and teeth, and from that infer some uh, idea of what diet they had, at least when they were growing up, growing those bones and teeth. And these people were not living a marine diet. They weren't uh, living on mussels and fish and so forth. Uh, they were farmers. So we've got a load of farmers uh, at a time when the climate was getting colder, which is worse. Getting, when, it, when the climate is deteriorating, people mean it's getting colder. That's pretty much standard what they mean, particularly in Northern Europe. So it's getting colder. And some people say that that explains conflict. Uh, at times when the, 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 the conditions are getting worse, uh, people are put under more stress, and so they're more likely to end up competing for what few resources are left, and that leads to more warfare. Yes, I can see how that 
could happen, but I can also see how the opposite could happen. In times of tremendous plenty, you have a huge surplus population and loads of people are well fed. What are we going to do with them all? Well, we could go and try conquering them. I mean, we've got the manpower. So I, and I could see how uh, more people are more likely to encounter each other and more likely to uh, rub each other up the wrong way and end up fighting. So I, I, I don't I don't wholeheartedly buy into this uh, more stress, fewer resources equals more warfare uh, notion. Um, but anyway, um, how do we know that these people were fighting a battle? Well, we don't really. As I say, we haven't found a settlement, um, but we haven't found any evidence whatsoever that these people were buried. And people were, were given funeral rites in these times. Uh, there are no tombs, there are no urns, there are no grave goods, there are, there's, there's no apparent deliberate uh, digging of pits to put these bodies in. They just appear to be wherever they have fallen. Um, and there is no evidence on any of them that they've been gnawed by rats or scavenged on by, by wolves or anything like that. So it seems that these bodies were either thrown into the river uh, immediately after the battle or perhaps they died in the river and they, the river then swallowed them up and that's how they came to survive to be found today by us. Um, now, as for dating, it seems that about 1230 BC is when all these bones suddenly got deposited all at once. Um, with carbon dating with bones, you always get an age range, something like 1200 BC, plus or minus uh, 40 years. And even that's not absolute cutoff. That's just within a certain standard deviation. So um, uh, the, the, the best fit line is 1230 BC, which, uh, just to put it in context, 1250 BC is the usual date that people guessing when the Trojan War happened, if it happened, happened. So it's around the time of the Trojan War, these Germans were bashing each other. Um, but they were perhaps bashing each other, uh, not with bronze swords, not a single bronze sword has been found there, uh, and there are no uh, wounds that are clearly uh, the result of being cut with a sword. Um, so it could be that these, these farmers were equipping themselves a little bit for, um, for warfare. They had you know, a spearhead, uh, perhaps that was of bronze, they had a knife, might not have been a purpose-built dagger, but you know, a knife will still cut a throat, even if it's your normal kitchen knife. And for that sort of mid-range combat, which might not happen, but just in case it does, a simple wooden club will do. Now, there was a problem there because um, the carbon date for uh, the wooden club that they dated came out as significantly older than the bones, which was a shame because they were so excited that these, these clubs were found in direct association with the bones. But it's actually not too big a problem, partly because, as I say, carbon dates are not absolutely hard and fast, uh, but also because it's perfectly possible that someone brought his great granddad's club to the fight. Or, possibly, uh, only, only a month earlier, he made that club from scratch from the heartwood, the, the hard heartwood at the center of a big tree that was over 200 years old. So that's perfectly possible. There are lots of trees that are over 200 years old. So yeah, it's possible that it was just an old club or old wood in a new club. So um, that's as far as we can really take it. It's not proof of a battle, but the numbers are much greater than other examples from other places in the world. There were, I think, 22 found in a pit in Norway. There were something teen in, in, in the Netherlands. There are about five or something found in a, a pit in Britain. These are young men with wounds on them, perhaps with associated weapons, but they're in an excavated pit. They've been thrown in there deliberately afterwards. They're not actually the scene of the battle itself. This appears to be the scene of the battle itself. And even though we don't have the, 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 the flashy swords, you know, a sword, yeah, they may be very high status, they may look very nice, they may be good for impressing, impressing people, and of course they're sharp and so they can cut you, but actually, if someone takes a good stout stick and belts you in the face with it, that'll do the job. Did the 